Lynn Stanford was bored. In 1872, Stanford was a wealthy horse racing enthusiast with way too much time on his hands. Spending much of that time at the track, he became convinced that a horse at full gallop lifted all four hooves off the ground. His friends scoffed at the idea. Unfortunately, a horse's legs moved so fast that it was impossible to tell with the human eye. So, he turned to nature photographer Edward Moybridge and offered him $25,000 to photograph a horse mid-gallop. Six years later, Moybridge perfected a technique of photographing a horse in motion with a series of 12 cameras triggered in sequence. One of the photos clearly showed that all four of the horse's hooves left the ground at full gallop. Stanford won the bet and went on to found Stanford University. Moybridge pocketed the $25,000 and became famous for the invention of series photography, a critical first step towards motion pictures. The basic concept of animation was already in the air through earlier inventions like the magic lantern, but a photorealistic recreation of movement was unheard of. Moybridge's technique laid the groundwork for other inventors to develop new ways of photographing and projecting movement. By 1893, 15 years after Moybridge won Stanford's bet, Thomas Edison had built the first movie studio, a small, cramped, wood frame hut covered in black tar paper with a hole in the roof to let in sunlight. One of the first films they produced was a five-second scene of a man sneezing. Riveting stuff. But still, movies were born. Sort of. There was just one problem. The only way to view Edison's films was through a kinetoscope, a machine that allowed a single viewer to peer into a viewfinder and crank through the images. The ability to project the images to a paying audience would take another few years. In 1895, Woodville Lantham, a chemist, lured away a couple of Edison's employees and perfected the technique of motion picture projection. In that same year, over in France, Auguste and Louis Lumière invented the cinemagraph, which could perform the same modern miracle. The Lumière brothers would receive most of the credit, but Lantham and the Lumières essentially tied for first place. Those early years of cinema were marked by great leaps forward in technology, but not so much forward movement in terms of art. The films were wildly popular because no one had ever seen anything like them, not because they were breaking new ground narratively. It was Georges Méliès who became the most well-known filmmaker as entertainer in those first few years. Méliès was a showman in Paris with a flair for the dramatic. Over the next couple decades, he produced hundreds of films that combined fanciful stagecraft, optical illusions, and wild storylines that anticipated much of what was to come in the next century of cinema. His most famous film, A Trip to the Moon, produced in 1902, transported audiences to the surface of the moon on a rocket ship, and sometimes even included hand-tinted images to approximate color cinematography. By the start of the 20th century, cinema had become a global phenomenon. But it was the United States that was destined to become the center of the cinematic universe, especially as it grew into a global mass entertainment medium. Lois Weber was an early innovator and the first American director, male or female, to make a narrative feature film in 1914. Others, like D.W. Griffith, followed suit. Griffith helped pioneer the full-length feature film and invented many of the narrative conventions, camera moves, and editing techniques still in use today. Weber, Griffith, and many other filmmakers and entrepreneurs would go on to establish film studios able to turn out hundreds of short and long-form content for the movie theaters popping up on almost every street corner. This new entertainment industry was not, however, located in Southern California. Not yet, anyway. Almost all of the production facilities in business at the time were in New York, New Jersey, or somewhere on the East Coast. Partly because the one man who still controlled the technology that made cinema possible was based there, Thomas Edison. Edison owned the patent for capturing and projecting motion pictures, essentially cornering the market on the new technology. If you wanted to make a movie in the 1900s or 1910s, you had to pay Edison for the privilege. 
Not surprisingly, a lot of would-be filmmakers bristled at Edison's control. And since patent law was difficult to enforce across state lines at the time, many of them saw California as an ideal place to start a career in filmmaking. Sure, the weather was nice, but it was also far away from the Northeast as you could possibly get within the continental United States, and a lot harder for Edison to sue for patent violations. By 1912, Los Angeles had replaced New York as the center of the film business, attracting filmmakers and entertainment entrepreneurs from all over the world. Universal Pictures, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, Warner Brothers, all of them motion picture factories able to mass-produce dozens, sometimes hundreds, of films per year. One small neighborhood in the heart of Los Angeles became most closely associated with the new industry. Hollywood. By 1915, Thomas Edison admitted defeat and dissolved his motion picture patent. In the heyday of those early years, some of the larger studios decided the best way to ensure an audience for their films was to own the theaters as well, effectively controlling all aspects of the business, production, distribution, and exhibition. In business terms, that's called vertical integration. Then, in 1927, everything changed. Warner Brothers was a family-owned studio run by five brothers, but one of those brothers, Sam, had a vision. Up to that point, cinema was still a silent medium, but Sam was convinced that sound, more specifically sound synchronized to the image, was the future of movies. And almost everyone thought he was crazy. Fortunately, Sam persisted, investing the company's profits into the technology required to record synchronized sound and reproduce it in movie theaters around the country. Finally, on October 6, 1927, Warner Brothers released The Jazz Singer, the first film to include synchronized dialogue. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute, I tell you. You ain't heard nothing. It was a huge success. Suddenly, every studio was scrambling to catch up to Warner Brothers. That meant a massive investment in sound technology. Not every production company could afford the upgrade, and many struggled to compete in the new market for films with synchronized sound. And just when it seemed like it couldn't get worse for those smaller companies, in 1929, the stock market crashed, plunging the nation into the Great Depression. Hundreds of production companies closed their doors for good. The golden age of Hollywood was dominated by eight powerful studios and defined by crucial business decisions. A crucial business decision was the specialization or house style of each major studio. Rather than try to make every kind of movie, the studios knew they needed to lean into what they did best. The house style of a given studio meant that all of their resources went into making the very best version of a certain kind of film. For Universal, it was the horror movie. For Warner Brothers, it was the gritty urban crime thriller. They were cheap to make and audiences ate them up. Gangsters, detectives, femme fatales, these were all elements of Warner Brothers films of the period. This is the second time that you have laid hands on me. When you're slapped, you'll take it and like it. And for MGM, it was the prestige picture. An MGM movie almost always centered on the elite class, lavish set designs, and rags to riches stories. Has the war started? But the fun and profits couldn't last forever. In 1948, the U.S. government filed a case against the major studios, finally recognizing that vertical integration was an unfair monopoly over the entertainment industry. The case went to the Supreme Court, and in a landmark ruling known as the Paramount Decision, the court ordered that all the major studios had to sell off their theater chains. It was a financial disaster for the big studios. And then it got worse. The television set was quickly becoming a household item.
By the end of the 1940s and into the 50s, the rise of television entertainment meant fewer reasons to leave the house for movies. It was the end of an era. The end of the Golden Age thrust Hollywood into two decades of uncertainty as the major studios struggled to compete with the new Golden Age of television. There were plenty of successes, however. MGM's focus on musicals like Singing in the Rain in 1952, for example, helped keep them afloat. I'm singing in the rain, just singing in the rain, what a glorious feel, and I'm happy again. But throughout the 50s and 60s, studios found themselves spending more and more money on fewer and fewer films and making smaller and smaller profits. And that's when Warren Beatty, an ambitious young actor, walked into Jack Warner's office with a scandalous script about two mass murderers. Beatty wanted to make something bold and unpredictable. Warner Brothers bankrolled Bonnie and Clyde in 1967 and had to admit they had a huge hit on their hands. And audiences, especially younger audiences, loved it. Good afternoon. This is the Barrow Gang. The next I'm decade would become TV another TV creative TV. renaissance for the film industry known as the New Hollywood. The New Hollywood emphasized the authority of the director and star over the material, not the central producer. Films like The Godfather in 1972 broke every accepted norm of cinematography, sound design, narrative structure, editing, performance, and even distribution models, and in the process broke every box office record. But such unpredictability couldn't last forever. The new Hollywood was done in by a one-two punch of films that were so successful, so astronomically profitable, they would have to coin a new term for them. Blockbusters. It was meant to be a run-of-the-mill, universal monster movie. This time around, it would be a shark. A really big shark. And in an effort to save some money, they assigned a young 28-year-old television director named Steven Spielberg to helm the project. Jaws, in 1975, cost $9 million to make, but it grossed more than $120 million in its first theatrical run. It hit Hollywood like a tidal wave. A simple genre movie with clear heroes and just enough eye-popping special effects to wow the audience. Best of all, there was no need for an expensive, star-studded cast or a well-known, temperamental director. The concept was the star. It was a formula the studios knew they could replicate. Two years later, 20th Century Fox released Star Wars. Its success dwarfed that of Jaws. Hollywood would never be the same. I've been waiting for you, Obi-Wan. We meet again at last. The circle is now complete. When I left you, I was but the learner. Now I am the master. Only a master of evil does. The rise of the blockbuster breathed new life into Hollywood's studio system. But with increasing profits came interest from investors and larger corporations. Back in 1983, 90% of all American media was controlled by over 50 distinct companies. By 2012, that same percentage was controlled by just six. One of those companies was Disney. Disney as a studio had been around since the 1920s, but came into its current power with the Disney Renaissance, a period from 1989 to 1999, during which Walt Disney Feature Animation returned to producing critically and commercially successful animated films that were mostly based on well-known stories, much as the studio did during the era of Walt Disney himself. The resurgence allowed Disney's animated films to become powerhouse successes at the domestic and foreign box office, earning much greater profit than most of the Disney films of previous eras. The blockbuster was aided with various technological innovations in this period, including CGI. First created in the 1950s, CGI, or computer-generated images, became popular with the rise of computers in the 1980s, and is a core element of blockbusters today.
But corporate Hollywood isn't the only hope for cinema. Perhaps the most exciting new direction in cinema is not found in theaters at all. For more than a century, cinema has been most closely associated with that roughly 90-minute, close-ended feature film playing at a theater near you. And while that continues to be an important cinematic space, the rise of cable and streaming services in desperate need of content has created exciting new frontiers to explore for the medium. And while it's tempting to call this a new golden age of television, even the term television no longer seems appropriate. We consume this content on all manner of devices, on our phones, laptops, even on our wristwatches. Streaming service Netflix was founded in 1997 as a mail-order video rental company, but eventually shifted its main focus to online streaming, and by 2010 became the largest source of internet streaming traffic. In 2013, the company began releasing original content. In the 2020 awards season, Netflix received 24 Academy Award nominations, more than any of the traditional movie studios it was up against. Ultimately, regardless of how it's made or how we engage with it, all of the above still fits into one artistic medium, cinema, the art of motion picture. The tools and techniques, the principles of form and content are all exactly the same. And that will be true whatever comes next. Narrative, cinematography, editing, sound and acting will all still matter. And our understanding of how those tools and techniques not only shape the medium, but also shape our culture will also still matter, maybe more than ever.